Acts in chapter 9. Years ago in England, there were two brilliant antagonists of the Christian faith. One was named Gilbert West and another named Lord Littleton. Lord Littleton. Each of these guys said it as their life's ambition to destroy Christianity, and they were friends with each other. They believed that if they could disprove two of the claims of the Bible, just two claims of Christianity, they could destroy people's faith in God. The first was the resurrection, and the second was the conversion of Saul. Each chose one of these topics and did research to discredit it. Months later, they came back together and found that each of them, independent of one another, had in the course of their study become a born-again Christian themselves. <laughs> a study of the resurrection uh, can lead you to be saved. Littleton had studied Saul, and he later wrote, quote, The conversion and apostleship of Paul alone, duly considered, is of itself a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity and to be a divine revelation. You know, a lot of people make arguments against Christianity. You can argue if you want, but one thing nobody can argue with is your experience your personal experience and oh what a change happens when a person is born again and what a change happened in the heart of Saul who became Paul look at Acts 9 verse 1 Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest in verse 2 he wants to take Christians bound unto Jerusalem Verse 3, is on the road to Damascus. And verse 4, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he, Saul, said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to resist, to kick against the pricks of the Holy Spirit convicting your heart. Verse 6, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city. And in the next few verses, we see what happens as he is converted. And look down at verse 21. All that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? Stop right there. As we study about Paul, we study the amazingly potent, soul-saving power of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which enables us all to see the light. You remember that day when you saw the light? If you were among the early Christians, just after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, the name Saul would actually ring fear in your ears. Saul wanted Christianity destroyed. He traveled far and wide to make it happen. He gave approval of the most brutal of deaths. But in Acts 9, Saul, who had been blinded by unbelief, was blinded by the light of Christ and saw the light and was converted. He became a trophy of God's grace. And since millions upon millions of Christians... Trace, have traced their spiritual roots back to him. God took a man who was a persecutor and made him an apostle. He had been a staunch defender of the law, Old Testament, and became a preacher of grace. He called himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but became a voice unto the Gentiles. And it was Paul who wrote the verse we quote so often. Let's read it aloud. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Paul was the one who said that, and he said it from personal experience. 
a lady was walking out of a beauty shop one day and passed another lady who said, Ah, Mary Smith, I haven't seen you in years. My, how you've changed. I love your hair. New outfit. You've slimmed down. Uh, What a difference it's made, Mary. And the lady replied, My name is Martha Jones. And she said, You even changed your name. (laughs) Saul was so radically changed that God even changed his name. It was like he was on something. As a matter of fact, let's call it LSD. A spiritual LSD we find in our text as Saul received a new Lord and new sight and a new dynamic for living. Let's take those one at a time. Saul received a new Lord. Up until this point, he was all about power and prestige and persecution. But in verse number six, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he called him Lord nine more times in the rest of this passage. Because just five seconds with Jesus Christ was enough for this man Saul to be under new management and to have a new Lord. Let me encourage you folks, don't just receive him as Savior, make him Lord. The Bible says that we need to confess him as Lord, which means our boss, our master, our commander, our new leader to follow. Now, sanctification is when we make him Lord of every area of our life. But on the day that we're saved, we proclaim him to be the Lord. Romans 10, 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe. See, we've got this easy believism today that wants to make him Savior, but not make him Lord that wants to have the faith of going to heaven without the repentance of turning from sin and making him be your Lord. Philippians 2, verse 10, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is who? Is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Saul received a new Lord and a new sight. Look down in verse number 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. This literally happened in the physical realm that he got his sight. But it's meant to illustrate something in the spiritual realm which happens to us when our eyes are opened. Now, some will sit even in church pews for years waiting to be saved until they see it clearly, not realizing you don't see it clearly until you get saved. Until he believed, until he confessed him as Lord, he did not receive his sight. And then he could see it all so clearly. Um, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man, that's the lost man, the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. You have to have your eyes opened. Now, if you're ready for this, we're going to fly through so many verses so quickly that we're going to use the screen for it all. But the Bible paints a picture to us about spiritual sight and spiritual blindness. So just look at the screen, if you would. Psalm 82, 5 says, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Isn't it a world of darkness that we are in? All around us is the darkness. And we are to reflect the light, the light of Christ. Proverbs 4.19, the way of the wickedness, the wicked is as darkness. Then it says, they know not at what they stumble. They need their eyes opened. Jesus said in Matthew 13.13, 13, and he was quoting Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, who all said something along these lines. Uh, they seeing, see not. Hearing, they hear not. They're deaf, they're dumb, they're blind. Seeing, they see not. 
Blind leaders of the blind he spoke of in Matthew 15, 14, both falling into the ditch. Matthew 23, 26, he said, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which was within the cup, and then you can see to clean the outside. Blindness. Mark 4, 15 says, when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh the word that was sown in their hearts. He's blinding them. John 1, 5, the light shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. And you know what it says in John 3, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Go on to the next verse, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. It's in John 8, 12. Jesus spake, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. He's the light. Acts 26, 18. I'm there to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. Paul knew their problem. He had been spiritually blind himself. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 14, he said, Their minds are blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil as they read the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, the light who opens our eyes. Aren't you thankful that Jesus gives us sight? Aren't you thankful for the day that you saw the light? Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says it's the God of this world, that's Satan, who blinds the minds of them which believe not, 2 Timothy 3, ever learning but never able to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's sad. And yet even Christians can walk back in the ways of darkness, in the ways of spiritual blindness. Ephesians 5, 8, you were sometimes darkness, now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Hey, you're not part of the darkness anymore. Don't walk in darkness anymore. Why return to the dark ways? 2 Peter 1, 9 says, he that lacketh these things is blind and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Don't go back to the old ways. 1 John 1, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We need to consider whether we truly are saved. The next chapter, 1 John 2, he that saith he's in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. And one last verse, prophetic of this age, these last days in which we find ourselves, Jesus said to the end times church in Revelation 3.17, it's because thou sayest, I am, in, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And so our prayer must be that of the psalmist in Psalm 119, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's why you're in church today, right? To open the word, have your eyes opened to the truth. In three days of blindness, Saul had time to think. He realized, first of all, that Jesus was alive. He had heard the claims of his resurrection, but he did not believe. His eyes were closed to that. Have you ever been trying to reach someone and it doesn't matter how good of a job you do at refuting their claims or of showing them the truth, they just have a wall up. They just are closed off to it. They just don't believe. You can't make anyone believe. They say you can lead the horse to water, right? But you can't make him drink. He realized during those days of blindness that Jesus was alive. That means that Jesus was the promised Messiah of that law that he, Saul, had always celebrated the Old Testament law, but said, that's not the Messiah. And he realized that is the Messiah. And we, the Jews, my people 
and the Romans, the Gentiles, all of humanity put him to death. And now I'm putting people to death who follow him. Three days of blindness, a lot must have gone through his mind. But he received a new sight because the scales fell from his eyes. His eyes were opened. Think back to when you were saved. Um, you were probably saved in the 21st century or the 20th century. How many of you were saved this century? Since the year 2000, it was your salvation. Okay, there's one over here. So many have been saved then for more than 20, 22 years. 20th century salvations, let's see your hand all across the room. And 19th century salvations, let's see. There we go. You look really good for being from the 1800s. <laughs> we got you there, I'm sorry. I thought you were joking with me. For me, it was on September 7th of 1977. You don't have to know the date. My mom happened to write it down. For me, is how I know that date. I was a little guy. Uh, but one thing was for sure, I couldn't see how things could work out unless I was to get saved. And once I got saved, I saw things differently. Now, how many of you were saved as adults all across the room? You were an adult when you were saved. That means you probably had some history. You probably had some baggage. You probably had more that you were saved from than this little six-year-old boy had. The eye-opening experience, a life-changing experience. When the scales fall off, that's when the pervert begins to see his sin the way that God sees it. God help us to hate sin the way that he hates it. And once we're saved, we're supposed to see it in an all new light. When the scales fall off is when the drunk recognizes his problem. It's when the thief understands his plight. When your eyes are opened is when the liar recognizes their need to walk in truth. And the thief confesses the error of his way. And education isn't the answer, is it? You can educate someone all you want and all you end up with is a smarter thief. Now he can embezzle from the company because <laughs> you haven't changed his heart if you're just educating the head. Saul got a new Lord. He got new sight. He saw it all differently. Saul got saved, and he went on his way to Arabia. Let's show him a map of Arabia, okay? You can see Damascus on the right side of the screen, and at the bottom right, Arabia. He went south to study for three years. He had read the Old Testament dozens and dozens of times as a good Jew. But when he reread the Old Testament, now he saw Jesus on every page. That's right. How many times had he read about the lamb on the brazen altar in his Old Testament and not recognized Jesus? But now that's him. That's him. He is the lamb. I heard about John talking about behold the lamb. He was telling the truth. We had John killed for saying that. Yes, they did. When he read his Old Testament and saw the priest washing his hands at the brass laver, he saw Jesus, the water of life. When he read of the holy place in the tabernacle and the temple and he saw the lampstand, he thought of Jesus, the light of the world. 
When he turned then to his left to the table of showbread, he saw Jesus, the bread of life, and then caught a whiff of something from the altar of incense and realized Jesus was his great high priest who ever liveth to make intercession for us. He went to Arabia with the Old Testament in his knapsack and he came out with the book of Romans in his heart and taught us Romans 3.10 that there's none that doeth good. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8 that God commends or gives his love toward us in, in this way and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is what? eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He got a new Lord. He got new sight. <clears throat> the scales had fallen off. God used him to pen the plan of salvation so clearly he who was blind now could see. Saul is now Paul. Do you know Revelation says that you're going to have a new name? One day, a new name. Every shred of the old life here on the earth will be gone because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. A new Lord new sight, LSD, a new dynamic. Paul received a new dynamic. Look down in verse number 20 at everything that happened in a matter of just a very few days. Verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Verse 22, and Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. Down to verse 29. And he was with them coming in, uh, verse 29, he spake, spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. They went about to slay him. Oh, now the one who was killing people, now he's being hunted. Why? Because he's proof positive that Jesus Christ, no, nobody gives their life for something unless it's true, unless it's real. He's proof positive that this is the real thing, that Jesus is the Messiah. Now they've got to rub him out. Now go back to our first verse this morning, verse 1 of our text, chapter 9 and verse 1 is the picture of a bull. You know how a bull, they just ran the bulls again there in, uh, where do they do the running of the bulls? That place where they run and the idiots stand in front of them. You know what I'm talking about? Um, you know how a bull goes like this with its hoof and he was as an animal breathing, verse 1, Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. This is the same guy just a few days later. God got his attention and touched him and tamed him in an instant and he became a trophy, a trophy of God's grace. Now, if you've read many of Paul's writings and he wrote half your New Testament, Paul always regarded himself as a brand that was plucked from the burning fire. He described himself as the chief of sinners, less than the least of all saints, he said of himself. He called himself the least of the apostles. I could debate that. He said, I'm not fit to be an apostle. In 2 Corinthians, he said, I am nothing. And you know what? I was changed like that too. You were changed like that too if you've been born again. And if you've not yet, you can be changed like that also. Also, 
do what Saul did as you face God. Say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord. And what you surrender, he'll take. And what he takes, he cleanses. And what he cleanses, he fills. And what he fills, he uses. And then he gets the glory for it all. You know, some say, have illustrated Christianity as like a tadpole becoming a frog. There's a metamorphosis that takes place. I really don't like that. That's a long process. It's basically still the same thing, just in a different form. It's not like it's evolving or really changing fundamentally. I don't think being a Christian is like a tadpole becoming a frog. I would say it's more like a frog receiving the kiss of grace and becoming something new, becoming a prince, a child of the king. Old things passed away, all things become new. There was an old man who was fishing and he heard a voice down at his feet which said, Psst, look down here. Look down here. It was a frog on the ground by his foot. He looked at it. The frog said, kiss me and I'll become a beautiful princess. He picked up that frog and put it in his pocket. He continued on his day and he heard Psst, from his pocket. Didn't you hear me? I said, kiss me and I'll become a beautiful princess. He ignored it. Finally, that frog was hopping around in his pocket. Listen to me. Kiss me. I'll become a beautiful princess. He said, honestly, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> I don't think that had anything to do with the message at all. But you learned at least one thing today. The voice of the Lord is undoubtedly in these moments confronting someone on their road. He's been trying to get your attention. He has great changes planned and wonderful things in store if you will listen and close your eyes to this world. Be blind to all of that and let him pull the scales from your eyes and open your eyes and show you what he has in store. It was many decades ago that Billy Graham was conducting a crusade in Los Angeles and a man named Stuart Hamblin got saved. How many of you have heard of Stuart Hamblin? You know that name. Uh, he was a cowboy actor and singer who worked with the likes of Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and John Wayne. Stuart Hamblin got saved and he went to John Wayne and told him that he got saved and John congratulated him. Stuart then tried to witness to the Duke. And he said these words, it's no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. He said those words to John Wayne. John said, that's really beautiful. You ought to turn that into a song. John Wayne didn't get saved that we know of, but we still sing the song that Stuart wrote. Sing it with me. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Lord, thank you for your word that shows.